around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to welcome you today to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Monday, August the 16th, 2022. We welcome everyone, wherever that you are, wherever that you might be, and we thank you for allowing us to come into your home, your place of business. Maybe you're riding down the road in your automobile. Maybe you're getting dressed to go to work. I don't know, but we certainly thank you for tuning in and listening to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. I do want to make mention again because we're just a couple weeks out. Next week and the following week and then that weekend, we're going to be having our Revival in America meeting at the Hickory Metro Convention Center in Hickory, North Carolina. Please come, bring someone with you, And please bring your faith. If you will bring your faith and everyone else brings their faith, I believe believe our faith together can move mountains. I believe God will do great, great things. And I believe you'll experience a touch of God and you'll never again be the same. Listen, you cannot be touched by the Spirit of the living God and remain the same. You will be changed. And you will be indelibly, eternally impressed so much by the Spirit and presence and power of God, you will never, ever, ever again be the same. When God touches you, You cannot get away from that touch. Through my walk with God, I've had several encounters with God beginning at the age of 12. And that changed my life as a little little lad, a little boy. Changed my life. And I could never get away from that. No, No matter how far and deeply and to the dregs of sin I went, I could not get away from that encounter with God, and neither will you. If you've ever been touched by the Holy Ghost, you cannot get away from it no matter how hard you try, no matter how much alcohol you drink, no how much, no matter how many drugs that you take and often you take them, and no matter all the illicit sexual relationships you've had, You'll never be the same when you're touched by the power and by the presence of the living God. I do want to make mention one more time of this book, America is Too Young to Die, A Call to Revival by Leonard Ravenhill. As I've said many times in this program, these programs, you will not read this book once and lay it down. You'll pick it up and read it, and read it, and read it, because it has an anointing of the Holy Ghost upon it. Leonard Ravenhill is dead and gone, but his his life, his ministry, his legacy lives on because he had a great, great relationship with God. Again, America is Too Young to Die, A Call to Revival, Leonard Ravenhill, for a love gift of $25, write us, phone us, 704 538-8060, write us, Post Office Box 502, Kaser, C-A-S-A-R, North Carolina, 28020, or go to our website. It's there at the bookstore. Order it. We do ask for a love gift of $25. That's just to pay for the book and cover the cost of postage. We're not making anything. I'm just trying to get something powerful into your hands. Amen. Every one of us should pray until something happens in us. That's the power of prayer. Prayer will change you. You will not experience 
the gravity and the power of prayer until you do it. I'm not talking about riding down the road, fighting traffic, fighting ignorant, stupid imbeciles who are driving another vehicle. I'm not talking about praying then. I'm talking about sequestering yourself, getting along with God, and getting into God's presence. Now, I know the Holy Ghost can come in the car, the truck, the automobile, wherever you are. He can come in there suddenly when you're not even expecting it to happen. But I'm talking about taking a consecrated time and going in there, communing, fellowshipping with God, and seeking his guidance, seeking his counsel, seeking his face. Admittedly, if I do not pray, I feel convicted. If I do not go to my study and get on my knees and talk to God, I, I feel convicted. I'm, I'm not doing something right. You, you, develop, you develop prayer. You, you develop prayer in your life when you truly develop the spirit of prayer in your life you'll see a difference you will see a difference but if you don't spend that time in prayer you won't see the difference but I promise you if you spend the time a habit uh, to inculcate, develop the habit of prayer. It'll make such a vast difference in your life. It'll help you, those of you who are struggling with issues in your life. I get emails, I get letters, people who want to quit smoking. Smoking is one of the hardest addictions to give up. I smoked when I was in the world. I only smoked when I drank. I don't know what it means to have that addiction. Most people didn't even know I smoked till I started drinking. And I know that cigarettes, you find the flavor, the taste that appeals to your palate. I smoked a cigarette called Kent, K-E-N-T. It was a very mild cigarette, but that's what I chose to smoke when I drank. And as I said, the night I gave my heart to the Lord, I never picked up another cigarette. I haven't, I haven't picked up a cigarette in 40, over 44 years. But it's not always like that for others. And that control, and they, they mix chemicals and different tobaccos to make it fit your taste, your palate, and then it affects you psychologically, neurologically. You need that flavor. You need that taste. You need that kick, you need that boost, whatever, and uh, that's why they have all kinds of different types of cigarettes. I read once where uh, people who are truly addicted to cigarettes, it's as hard as uh, uh, getting off of heroin. Now, I can't imagine that. Of course, I've never had heroin either, but it's, but it's difficult. But I do believe if you'll pray, and sometimes add a little fasting to it because most people want a cigarette after they eat. And if you can go two or three days without eating, that will help keep that at bay and help you to be delivered from that bondage. And I have no idea what cigarettes cost. The last time I heard it was around, I think, $5 a pack. It's a lot of money. Uh, it's $300 a month. Uh, excuse me, $150 a month on 30-day month. $1,800 a year, that's a, it's a lot of money uh, for something that you're just literally blowing up in smoke. And again, I don't say that to be crass or demeaning or condescending. I have empathy for you. I have empathy for you. I feel sorry for you that that has found a place of resonance in your heart and, and taken control of a part of your life, and you don't want it. That's the good thing. In your heart, you don't want it. When you get to the place in your heart that you don't want it, that's when God will help you get over it. See, when you say, I don't want this in my life, God will then divinely intervene. You know, now we're not talking about a health issue here. 
We're talking about a spiritual application now. When you say in your heart, I don't want this, that's spiritual. When you come to that state and place, God will help you because he cares and loves for you. Amen. We want to go today to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused. He refused by faith. In this verse, we see as Moses has come to years, meaning 40 years of age, he had had also come to be great in Egypt. He would be the successor following Pharaoh's demise, Pharaoh's death. But he had an encounter with God as well. And he had that encounter, that divine encounter, many times through different means and methods. We know his birth was unique. It was different. The Bible said his parents saw he was a proper child. There was something different. There was something unique about him. They hid him. His favor was killing all the Hebrew boys. Told the midwives, throw them into the Nile, kill them. But the midwife said, the Israeli women, they, they don't need any help. They're strong. They, they, they push out these kids, and bam, there it is. And we don't even have a, a, an opportunity to help them. You see, God was intervening and growing that nation. Even, even in pregnancy and deliverance, God was involved in it. <laughs> There's nothing that God cannot be involved in if he chooses to be involved in. He can change its course. So he, he greatly touched the women of Israel, their wombs, and their ability to have children. And it was not nearly as arduous and difficult as it was for the Egyptian children. And God blessed the midwives for their faithfulness in disobeying Pharaoh's command. We do know that Jochebed made Moses a, uh, a, a, an ark of bulrushes. She dubbed it with a slime and pitch. She placed him in the Nile among the reeds at the river's edge. And, of course, Miriam was standing in close proximity to see what would happen. And Pharaoh's daughter heard a cry. What she did not know, what Pharaoh did not know, 80 years later, the cry, the tears of that little Hebrew boy placed in an ark, placed in the reeds and the bulrushes, that little baby's cry would bring down an entire nation. Pharaoh's daughter had no idea when she heard the cry of that infant child what God would do 80 years later. You know, we're all guilty in the moment not realizing the significance of it. Sometimes things happen, and we don't realize the gravity, neither the magnitude of what will happen. But God, when he's involved in something, it will surely come to pass, no matter what men decree, no matter what men say, no matter what prophets purportedly prophesy, what God has decreed and declared himself, it will come to pass. We're told in Acts chapter 7, the great layman Stephen, Acts 7, 21 through 23, and when he was cast out or placed into the reeds, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. That's what it means there in Hebrews eleven twenty four. By faith, when he was come to years, 
refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he was 40 years of age, the word, the number 40 means trial and deliverance. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. Jesus fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights. We see that number continually in the scriptures. Israel was on the backside of the desert 40 years because of their sins. And so when Moses turned 40 years of age, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And that means that they were the slaves, they were the captives in Egypt. And Moses went unto them because they were his people. And so I find it astounding in that Moses, you remember, when God appears to him, he grumbles, he bickers, he complains, I do not speak well. God says, don't worry about that. I'm going to give you Aaron. He'll be your spokesman. It is amazing how many excuses we give God for why we cannot do something. But notice what the scripture says from Stephen's perspective there in Acts 7, 21 and 23. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. His words were powerful because he was touched by God. Again, the number 40 always speaks of trial and deliverance. It rained 40 days and 40 nights during the Noahic flood. Israel spent, as I said, 40 years in the wilderness. Christ fasted 40 days and 40 nights. In other words, trial and then deliverance. When we go through trials, we should always anticipate, look for, pray for, and believe God for deliverance. You see, it had become very arduous and very difficult for Israel as a nation in Egyptian bondage and captivity. They begin to cry. They begin to pray. They begin to call out to God. And what does God tell Moses? I have heard their cries. Moses was a type of Christ. That's why Jesus is our divine intercessor. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. We petition the Father in Jesus' name. John 14, 13. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that will I do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Remember, it's in Jesus' name we petition for these things. And, and so we, we pray that, we believe that. Jesus wants you to petition him. Jesus wants you to believe him. Again, John 14, 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. So God the Father is magnified, glorified, lauded, extolled when we petition him in Jesus' name. You see, the reason we pray in Jesus' name, that lets him know that we believe he is the only begotten Son of God. He's the one. He's the one that helps us. Now, what a great orchestration from Stephen as he declares the faithfulness of God throughout the children of God. Again, as I said yesterday, God allows men, especially in that time and day, to see things. Everything that Joseph was able to see futuristically, we see a measure of it and the scriptures, Joseph was given the full revelation of how all of this would take place. As I said yesterday, he knew, he understood completely. In 230 years or thereabouts, God, Elohim, would visit Israel while they're in Egyptian body. Thus, he says, don't forget my bones. Now, it doesn't appear but it could have existed 
Joseph didn't see their murmuring, bickering, grumbling, and complaining. How many times have we encumbered the will of God? We have done something, we have created a circumstance, a situation where it it, it, it hinders the work of God. I, I don't want to ever hinder God. Now, we know that Satan seeks to hinder us. Satan seeks to sift us. He seeks to destroy us. But let us never live in a manner wherein we, our personally, our personal lives, hinder the work of God. Stephen could see. He understood uh, and, and gave us words here in Acts 7 of how mighty and powerful Moses was. I think about that, and I'm thinking, Lord, that, that is so profound in what you're able to do and revealing yourself to men. But I assure you, these men prayed and sought God's face, and it became clear to them by their relationship with God. Stephen goes on and he declares the faithfulness of God throughout all of the children of Israel. Even though they disobeyed, even though they murmured, even though they complained, their shoes, neither their clothes, wore out while in the wilderness. Anybody ever had a pair of shoes to last for 40 years that you wore every day? Think of that. Garments did not wear out. That is the faithfulness of God. I believe it's David, the psalmist, he said, their feet did not swell. They, they walked out there in the wilderness year after year, year after year, over and over and over again. And God, not one time, he failed them. He did not fail them in any way, shape, or form. They are the ones that failed God. They are the ones that were robbed of what God wanted to do in their lives because they forgot God. They forgot God. How would you like to wake up every morning and go outside and there is angel's food? Angel's food all over the ground. The only requirement was gather up enough on the sixth day that you don't have to do it on the Sabbath day. And do you know what? They could not even do that. There were those who gathered up more than they needed on the, uh, the sixth day, and it, it turned into worms. It's amazing. All of the great things that God did for them, and yet they still would be disobedient. They would still do things that were in absolute disobedience to God. But nevertheless... Their garments, their shoes did not wear out. He, he, he provided, he protected them in every sense of the word. Why? Because he loved them. He cared about them. And so it is with you. God cares about you today. Do you reciprocate? Do you find the time to get into the presence of God? All right. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Let me just say this before I move on. He made a decision. No doubt it was not a popular decision. Now remember, this man has the opportunity to sit on the greatest throne in the entire world at that time. You talk about elevation. You talk about being lifted up. You talk about being made able to sit in lordship, power, kingship, authority, and he refused it. When's the last time you blatantly, willfully, adamantly refused an invitation of the enemy, whatever that he may have brought to you, an illicit affair, 
an opportunity to lie, to cheat, to steal, to pillage, to plunder, to do something that you know is not according to God's will, and you had the the spiritual intestinal fortitude to refuse. No, I will not do that. No, I will not say that. No, I, I will not go there. You refused it wholeheartedly. You just said no to it. There are times in my life I've had to say no. I utterly, absolutely refuse to go down that path. When I was still single before I got married, I refused to allow myself to be overcome by sin, any any kind of sin. I made a decision. I made a choice. And I had to refuse opportunities. I had to refuse open doors. I had to refuse the potential. When you sell out to God, you have to refuse some things. He refused, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, certainly as a purported orphan, child just found in the Nile, would want to be highly esteemed, lauded and extolled as the king's daughter, son. Hey, you know who I am? I'm Pharaoh's daughter's son. I'm the next in line for succession. I'm, I'm the next to sit on the throne. But the Bible says he refused that. This sometimes demonstrates the, the measure of consecration in our lives. What do I mean by that? An, it's a situation presents itself. Presents itself. Yet, no matter how appealing, no matter how good-looking, no matter what, how seductive, luring it may be, you refuse to go down that avenue. You refuse to walk down that path. Now, here's the subtleness, the duplicity, the deception of Satan. Well, now, go ahead, but... Don't walk all the way down the path. Just, just, just go a little ways down the path. And oh, how Satan paints such a pretty, enticing picture. Oh, that woman would make you happy. Oh, that man would make you so unbelievably happy. Don't underestimate the power of satanic enticement. He'll give you all the glit, all the glamour, all the earthly glory you would ever desire and make you think this is the creme de la creme relative to life. You see, that's the seductive spirit of Satan. He lures people in to a trap, a snare that is damnable, evil, pernicious, he, he will draw you into that. Yet, if your prayer life and your walk with God is where it ought to be, you will say, I refuse that. No, I'm not going to touch it, taste it, handle it, and look at it. I look at it for what it is, and I, I refuse to go that way. None of us understand Neither none of us know the many times that we were weak, we were anemic, we would have folded up like a cheap suit, but God gave us mercy and God gave us grace. You could not have handled the gravity of the temptation that Satan sent your way. You see, Satan has the ability, especially when working through sinners, to make such an appeal to them toward and for you. You know, we need to understand, guys, we're not the best-looking thing in the world, but Satan will bring a seductive spirit on a woman, and she will do everything to lure you in, or vice versa. A man will do everything that he can to lure the woman in. And it is an allurement of chaos 
disaster, destruction, and ruin. But we must be like Moses, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't even want the worldly, earthly recognition. Hey, this is the life, man. Success. I'm just an orphan placed in a a, 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 a small ark, placed in the bulrushes, the reeds around the Nile River. I cry as a baby, and Pharaoh's daughter hears my cry, brings me in, grooms me, educates me, and trains me until I am mighty in words and in deeds. But, but, the Bible says it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. It came into his heart. Now, let me, let me say this. Just as God came into his heart, Moses allowed that. He could have refused that, could he not? We all have free moral agency and choice. He could have refused that. No, he didn't resist that. Why? There was something unique about him at his birth, something different about him. And yet God knows everything. He knows everyone. He said about Abraham, I know Abraham. He will teach his children. Well, if you look at that on the surface, it looks as though God is already predestined, predetermined. That's the way it's going to be. But if God did that, Abraham had no choice, did he? But Abraham had choice. We all have choice. You see, our lives are filled with choices. I've made some bad choices in my life. But over the last 44 years, I've tried to make the very best pragmatic and prudent choice decisions I could make. Thus, if you acknowledge God, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge the Lord. He shall direct thy paths. Moses said, Nope. I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I refuse it. When was the last time something came and presented itself to you and you suddenly, quickly, without delay, without thought, refused it? Because this is where the devil gets us. This is all by faith. I'm talking about faith. This whole series is about faith. By faith, you must refuse to be called or embrace the temptation of the devil. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, 40 years of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Think about that. He refused it. Someone's listening to me now. There's going to be an opportunity. There's going to be a situation present itself, and you must refuse it. I don't know what it is. I don't know who you are. But I'm telling you, in a few days, there's going to be something that's going to present itself to you, and you know in your heart you must refuse to embrace it or accept it. And if you hesitate, you're giving place to the devil. You're, 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 you're making room. You're, you're making provision for failure. Jesus said this in Mark 8, 36, 37. What? Should it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? If you gain it all, what has it profited you? If you refuse the world, you'll gain it all in Jesus Christ. You have to refuse the world. You have to embrace the plea, the call, the guidance, the leadership of Jesus Christ in your life. Sadly, there will be those who will spurn and reject the plea of God. They will refuse what God brings to their life. They will refuse that. Why? Because the devil will convince them what he's offering them is far better, far greater than what Christ gives us. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
I said nothing could be further from the truth. Just as Moses refused. Now watch this. I, I believe this was the process. As Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, it entered into his heart. It came into his heart. Why? Because he refused. He refused Satan's temptation, Satan's luxuries, Satan's most finery, delicacies. He refused that, and because he refused that, it came into his heart to visit his brethren. So by refusing the things of the world, the things of the devil, God filled the void with his plan, his purpose, and his will. Sometimes we do, as I said a few moments ago, we hinder God. We hinder God. I'll never forget when I was reading in Psalms and, and, I, and I got the revelation. You know, sometimes you read a verse of Scripture, you think you know it, you think you got it, but then it comes up, well, I don't have it. I don't know it. But Psalms 34, excuse me, Psalms 37 Verses 4 and 5 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires, shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And I learned in that passage, just like you sitting there reading the Bible one day, I learned something profound. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, Whatever his will is becomes the desire of our heart. That happens because you're staying in his presence. You think you want something now, but you pray about it long enough. You stay in God's presence long enough. What God has willed in heaven will become your desire on the earth. Delight thyself in the Lord. He'll give thee the desires of thine heart. You see, I believe, just like Joseph, Potiphar's wife came to him. She didn't, she didn't beat around the bush, guys. She said, lie with me. I mean, come on, lie with me. He refused to lie with her. Because he refused, God was continuing to elevate him. Though he was being elevated, it looks like he's going downwards in the eye of the world because she mocked Potiphar and she said, you've brought a, a, a piece of trash into our home. He tried to rape me, honey. He tried to seduce me, honey. And see how he ran out of his garment? He, he was disrobing himself trying to seduce me. Of course, it was the exact opposite. And he fled. He refused. He refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife. It cost him. But see, God had dealt with him. God had dealt with Joseph in regards concerning his brethren and the children of Israel. It's, it, it's, it, it happened with Moses first. Then, it, Excuse me, it happens with Joseph first. Then it happens with Moses. Joseph refused Potiphar's wife. We'll just call her AOC today. Yeah. And Joseph refused her. Then it comes into the life and times of Moses. And again, he's being lured, he's being tempted, and, and the devil's trying to elevate him to Pharaoh's status. And he refused. And because he refused, God filled the void with more and more of himself being Elohim. And, 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 and when he did that, it came into his heart. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now, that's Acts chapter 7, verses 21, 22, and 23. It came into his heart. Heart. When you refuse the world, God will put something in your heart more greater, more far-reaching. But first, 
You have to say no. I, I believe, uh, in essence, that's a, a public confession uh, to say to the, to the world, watch me, I'm not going to follow the appeal of Satan for my life. I'm not going to be lured. I'm not going to be seduced. I say openly, no, no. You, you have to learn to say, no, I refuse. Some of you, because you're not praying and seeking God, you're weak, you're anemic. And sometimes it's hard to say no. Why? It's hard to say no because what Satan is making his appeal is the very thing you want. Now, I personally believe till Joseph married the, 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 the daughter that Pharaoh had given him, I believe he practiced celibacy. He wouldn't sleep with Potiphar's wife, would he? He's keeping himself because he understands God's touch on his life. But you see, Satan is trying to hinder that will, that plan of God in his life, and say, well, why don't, why don't, why don't you sleep with Potiphar's wife, and when he's, if he's caught in adultery, then Potiphar will have him executed. He was the head executioner. That's what Potiphar means, head executioner. But he said no. You see, Satan knows your weakness. He knows where to make an appeal to you. But what you need to understand is this. When Satan makes an appeal for you and you say no, you refuse to accept that God will bring something into your heart just like he did Moses. Now, no doubt, I believe this. When, when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, the Holy Ghost reiterated, reaffirmed, Joseph, Joseph, God's got great, great, great exceeding plans for your life. You will one day see those sheaves falling down and paying obeisance. So Joseph refused and had faith in what God had promised. And he said, no, I'm like Naboth. I'm not for sale. Of course, Joseph was way before Naboth, but my point is there have always been those in the Bible who are just not for sale, and they refused things offered to them. Remember Ahab said, I'll buy your vineyard. I'll give you a better vineyard than the one you have. I want your vineyard, but he refused to sell his vineyard because he said, this is my inheritance. Everyone listening to me, you already have an assured inheritance coming your way. Don't sell out. Don't barter your inheritance. Don't swap your inheritance. Don't sell your inheritance for this or that. Refuse it. Refuse it. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Don't think it was not bouncing around in his head. Moses, do you realize what this means to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter? Do you realize the certainty of your elevation if you just embrace this? You're in the world, folks. You're not of the world. Moses was in the world. Joseph was in the world. But they, we can see they were never of the world. And we can see in their lives how they refused certain things when they were presented to them. In a backslidden condition away from God, I was afforded opportunities. I was offered things that I knew that would, that would destroy me. Years ago, I, I, I played drums, and I worked for a man in the, in the nights and weekends. His name was Paul Coggins. He had about three lounges in Charlotte, and I, I worked for him on the side. And one night... The drummer for a particular band was sick, couldn't make it. And uh, another manager of one of the lounges, uh, Gary Bulls, said, 
David, you got to play. They found out I, I played drums. I said, no. No, you got to. You, you can't disappoint Paul. Paul needs you to do this. I said, no, I will not do this. You know why? I refused because I knew in my heart it may take me so much further away from God. Now, that may sound asinine and stupid to you, but I knew down in my heart there were things I had to refuse. No, I wasn't living right. But something in me, as I said at the beginning of this program, if you've ever been touched by the Holy Ghost, you'll never again be the same. I did have a fear of God in, 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 in a sense. I said no. Paul had brought Johnny Rivers out from California to do a concert. I worked that concert. Johnny Rivers wanted me to come back to go back to California with him. I said no. Why? I knew I had to refuse some things, even though I was in sin. But I knew the devil was trying to destroy my life. He will seek to destroy your life, but you must be strong enough in that moment, in that very split second, say no. No. No deal. I will not. Listen, you can't make a deal with the devil and be successful. But let me tell you about the devil. He will paint it up. He will dress it up. He will make it smell so beautiful. He'll make it so opulent, so delicious, so overwhelming that if you're not careful, you will say, well, I, I'm not going to go all the way, but I'm going to go part of the way. You're making a deal with the devil. Oh, you don't see it right now. But Satan is a master chess player. Oh, he's making a move right now before you. And, and it doesn't look too tantalizing. It doesn't look too uh, enticing. It doesn't look too luring. But just make that little deal, and, and he'll trap you and snare you till you make the greatest deal of all, and you lose your soul. I knew some of those things would no doubt cost me my soul. So you must refuse. You must say no. Because if you do not refuse and you do not say no, sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And sin will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. Joseph fled out of Potiphar's wife's clutches. There was no debate. There was no chatter. There was no talk. There was none of that. Suddenly, the man of God fled, and he fled as quickly as he could because he understood completely. He understood the clutches, Satan's clutches. Satan's reach was through Potiphar's wife. That was the devil. That was the devil personified in her. And it was the devil personified and Pharaoh's daughter to say, you're going to be called my son. And Moses said no. Joseph said no. And look how God blessed them. Look how God kept them. Look how God preserved them. All because they refused by faith. Remember, this is all by faith. Believing God, believing Elohim, what he has promised that he said he would do, he will do it. Moses, when he was come to years, meaning 40 years of age, that's what that means, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Why? When God touches your life, now, I can't sit here and tell you from the time Pharaoh's daughter brought Moses out of the little ark and the bulrushes, I cannot tell you all the things that transpired in his life. We know his mother nursed him. Pharaoh's daughter paid her wages to nurse her own child. But at a certain age, that was done away with, and now Moses is living in Pharaoh's courts. Stephen tells us he, he was educated he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, 
mighty in words, mighty in deeds. But all of a sudden, after he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, it came into his heart to visit his true brethren, the children of Jacob slash the children of Israel. Some of you need to make a stand. You need to make a stand right now. There's a circumstance, there's a situation that Satan will try to use to make an appeal to you that if you're not careful, it will cost you everything. You don't see it now. You don't discern it now. But it's a trick. That's why it's called a trick. It is a trick. It is a trick. A trick is for the purpose of deceiving you. A trick is for the purpose of manipulating you. A trick, like a magician and a card trick or whatever it might be, it's a trick. It's not real. It's fabricated. The trick is for the purpose of manipulating. As Satan will say, does not this look great? Does not this look grand? But in your spirit, you'll get the witness, and the witness will say, you must refuse that. You must say no. You, you, you can't debate this. You can't talk about this. You, you cannot even uh, 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 meditate on this. You, you've got to flat out say no. You've got to flat out refuse. And this is the difficulty. If you do not refuse, just like Samson, sin took him further than he wanted to go. Sin kept him longer than he wanted to stay, and sin cost him more than he was willing to pay. We have examples in the scriptures of men who disobeyed God. Say what you will, but when David was on the balcony observing Bathsheba, the Holy Ghost said, get off the balcony, get in your palace and leave this alone. But he refused to hearken to the voice of the Holy Ghost, and he embraced the offer of the enemy. David should have refused immediately that appeal. Pardon the pun, pardon the expression, but that sex appeal. He should have abandoned it immediately, but he didn't. He didn't refuse it, and then it snowballed. And then in the end, God said, David, because of your willful, blatant disobedience and multiple sins of adultery and murder, etc., he said, the sword will never leave your house. Ask him after Nathan indicted him. Had you now have rather refused the temptation of the devil or refused the will of God? He said, I would have refused the temptation of the devil None of us knows the gravity of the price we might have to pay because of sin. I said, none of us knows the gravity of the price we might have to pay in rejecting sin. It may cost you so much The devil won't show you what it'll cost you. He will not show you of what sin will rob you of. But I promise you, sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Remember, Moses refused, and so must we. God bless you. Have a great week. Please register for the conference. We're just a little over two weeks out. I know God will visit and minister to us. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll see you Monday. In the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.